So today I'm going to present a paper from Box, which was published in this month's ClinEndo, and it's titled Performance Evaluation of Scoring Systems for Predicting Postoperative Hypertension Cure in Primary Aldosterolism. So primary aldosterolism, or PA, is the most common cause of secondary hypertension, and it's associated with excess cardiovascular morbidity compared to patients with essential hypertension. We know that unilateral disease is amenable to surgical intervention with the expectation of biochemical cure in terms of hypokalemia and alkalosis. But the restoration of normal tension without the need for any antihypertensives, which is probably the outcome that's most desired by patients, is less certain. And in fact, the hypertension cure rates range from between 32 and 42% six months postoperatively in a number of different international series, with the likelihood of persistent hypertension postoperatively being associated with several factors, including age, the duration of hypertension, antihypertensive use, and evidence of target organ damage. So just on antihypertensive abuse, if you have Cong syndrome and you have your adrenal out, after the operation, you can stop everything and start again, or you can leave them on everything and slowly win it down. I yeah. The difference, because have they discussed that? Is what, sorry, Prof? Have they discussed that? that uh, no, they've not. Uh, this is just a part of their introduction. Okay, thank you. So given all of this, how can we identify which PA patients preoperatively are most likely to have hypertension cure following adrenalectomy? And so there's been uh, six different preoperative scoring systems that have been developed to predict complete clinical cure. So that's normal tension without the need to be on any antihypertensives in primary aldosteronism post PA. And so they are the aldosteronoma resolution score or ARS, the PA Surgical Outcome Score, or PASO, as well as the normogram-based predictive score, the MBPS, as well as three other scores that have been proposed by Wachel, Morisaki, and Utsumi. And essentially, they all incorporate the duration of hypertension as well as the sex of the patient. And then they've also got variable other parameters, including BMI, um, antihypertensive medication, evidence of target organ damage, the adrenal nodule size, the age of the patient, whether there's any diabetes that coexists, and also the aldosterone to renin ratio. So for example, this is the uh, PASO scoring system, which has a online calculator that's quite similar to the Sheffield University fracture risk assessment tool. What it does is at the start, you basically calculate the DDD, which is the defined daily dose. So it gives you a huge list of antihypertensives. Uh, so this is just cut at L, but it continues beyond that. And then afterwards, you plug in the rest of the uh, patient details. And what it gives you is, in addition to the likelihood of complete cure, it also predicts what the likelihood of partial a clinical cure is or its complete absence. So whether the patient stays on exactly the same amount of antihypertensives or whether they're able to wean down some of the doses. So given that, unlike the other scoring systems, it's fairly unique because it allows you to identify those patients that are least likely to benefit from adrenalectomy as well as those in whom a clinical improvement in their hypertension cure is going to fall short of complete cure. So obviously that information is quite useful for both the clinician and also for the patient as well. So what is the benefit of these scoring systems? Well, arguably, if you have accurate preoperative cure prediction, then that has the potential to inform shared decision making. But it also uh, allows the patient to give truly informed surgical consent based on an individualized assessment of the potential benefit of adrenalectomy. Um, and therefore, uh, it provides both the patient, but also the, the doctor with quite a realistic expectation of what the outcome of surgery is. And that's probably most particularly helpful in those patients who have quite high perioperative risk. So it allows you to stratify them fairly early. Clearly, one of the issues with all of these scoring systems, as with most scoring systems, 
is that they are often very well and they perform well within the population in which they were developed and defined but whether they work in other populations is less clear and certainly with these scoring systems what we don't know is the comparative performance between them and that possibly the authors postulate is why they've had limited uptake into routine clinical practice. So what they've done in this current study is they've examined the performance of the six available preoperative prediction scoring systems within a single PA cohort at BARTS. So the patients were identified from their PA database at BARTS, and these were patients who'd undergone an adrenalectomy for primary aldosteronism between the 1st of January 2004 and the 31st of December 2018. And it's patients that they had uh, complete follow-up data for, but also complete preoperative data, which allowed them to then calculate all six of the scoring systems. The patients were all diagnosed with PA in accordance with endocrine society guidelines. So in 83 of the patients, unilateral PA was diagnosed after adrenal vein sampling. And then in four patients, they were assumed to have primary aldosteronism. And that was in patients who were under the age of 40 with a unilateral adrenal adenoma, but a normal contralateral gland on cross-sectional imaging. Then in terms of the, the definitions that they use, the biochemical and the clinical cure was assessed according to the PASO criteria. So that means for biochemical cure that they had normalization of their potassium as well as normalization of their aldosterone to renin ratio. And then they defined complete clinical cure as normal tension without the need to be on any antihypertensives. And so that clinical cure, they assessed at two time points. They did it firstly within the first post-operative year, which they term early, and then they do it at a final follow-up at least a year after surgery, which they define as late. So moving on to the results. So they identify 87 patients with complete pre-operative data sets, as well as post-operative follow-up data were identified who'd undergone uh, operative surgery with a unilateral adrenalectomy for primary aldosteronism. The mean age of the patient was 47.4 years and 62% were men. The mean BMI was at 31.4 and then the hypertension duration was 10 years. And we can see from the biochemistry that a fifth were also cortisol co-secretors uh, based on a failed overnight dexamethasone suppression test. And then in terms of the comorbidities, 20% had diabetes, and then a third had evidence of target organ damage from hypertension. So this table then compares the preoperative clinical and biochemical findings with the postoperative outcomes, which they've split into early and late follow-up. We can see that within the first post-operative year, there was a significant reduction in both the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, as well as a reduction in antihypertensive drug usage compared with preoperatively. As expected, we can also see a significant biochemical improvement uh, with a reduction in their serum aldosterone and the aldosterone to renin ratio. And there was also an increase in the potassium and also the plasma renin activity over that same time period. These are all findings that we would expect to see. What they also show in their cohort is that within the first post-operative year, the PASO complete biochemical cure rate was 85.1% and the clinical cure rate was 41.4%. So 41.4% of their patients were normotensive and off or antihypertensives. So that means some of the some of the complete biochemicals were actually on antihypertensives. Yes. Yeah, which yes. could have helped their, their path. For example, the renin would come up if you give them some drugs. Okay. But then when they looked at their late follow-up data, the PASO complete clinical cure rate then fell to 25.4%. And that was at the time of the final follow-up appointment. Right. 
So what they did next was they tried to determine whether there was a difference between each of the scoring systems. And so to do that, they did receiver operating characteristic curves or rock curves. And essentially the rock curve gives you a trade off between the sensitivity or the true positive rate, which is on the Y axis, and then the specificity or the true, uh, uh, sorry, the false positive rate on the X axis. So essentially what we're looking for is a close, a curve that's closer to the top left indicates a better performance. So on the left is the rock curve for complete clinical cure at early follow-up. And then on the right is the rock curve for the complete clinical cure rate at late follow-up. What we can see from their p-values is that there was a significant difference between the rock area under the curve at early follow-up, but th that at late follow-up, the tests seem to perform similarly. Yeah. And then that's kind of better depicted here. So this table essentially shows the uh, p-values for the pairwise comparison of the rock area under the curve. And they split it up into early and late. You can see that the PASO and also the Utsumi scores predicted outcome better than the Morisaki and the Wachul scores within the first post-operative year shown in red. Sorry, whereas there was no difference in the rock area under the curve at later follow-up. So in their cohort, the um, tests seem to perform better if you use the PASO and the Utsumi, whereas if you use the Morisaki and the Wachul, which had lower area under the curves, then it didn't predict and um, post-operative cure as well. So what they did next was they, they compared the performance measured using the pre-specified criteria that were defined in the original publication for the scoring system with their own cohort at BARTS. We can see that for all of the scoring systems, the rock area under the curve was lower at early follow-up than in the original cohorts, which I've marked with the red arrow. Whereas at late follow-up, the rock area to the curve was greater than at early follow-up in all of the scoring systems. And in fact, in their data set, it was marginally better than in the original cohorts when they used the PASO and the Utsumi scoring systems. So to be of generalizable use in everyday clinical practice, obviously it has to be preferable that the scoring systems can be directly applicable to every patient, regardless of their score. So as I mentioned earlier, the PASO, but also the Atsumi score gives uh, individualized cure probability. And what they did was they showed that with both of those scoring systems, they performed similarly in the BARTS cohort with a prediction accuracy that's close to 70% for early and then close to 80% for late follow-up. And that results concordance was about 90%. I wonder if you'd ever use a poor score and just say, no point having an operation, Mr. X, because your chances of cure are very low. So I think they, they stress in part that um, maybe the most useful people that you're going to use this for are people who firstly have a high perioperative risk and maybe it justifies your reason for not referring them for surgery. Yeah. Um, and then also for centres that are very overwhelmed or they don't have access to an endocrine surgeon, possibly abroad, that those patients, you can use them to basically refer the best patients who are going to get the best benefit from surgery rather than refer everybody. Um, and what they also do is they, they, they quote a paper that was showing that in certain centres, about 20% of the people who have an ABS that show that they would be amenable to surgery, then don't actually get referred to surgery. So actually you could therefore use these scoring systems to decide early on who is the best people to have ABS in the first place. Yeah, I mean, one of our policies is that we want to check the patient would want surgery before we go for an ABS. That, yeah. that should do. I mean, we, it might have, we might miss some because things don't always work to plan. Mm. But you're right, we shouldn't do an ABS if the patient definitely does not want an operation. Mm. Uh, so before I summarise the findings, what I'll do is I'll just go through some of the weaknesses. Um, firstly, a weakness of this single centre study is that it's retrospective, which means that there is actually risk of sampling bias, because in some patients, they weren't actually able to calculate all six of the scoring systems, so they were actually excluded. And in fact, what they also say in the discussion is that they have reported a cohort of 80% of the patients 
who actually underwent adrenalectomy for PA at the, during the study period. And that's because they're also running a, a concurrent prospective trial. So those patients therefore weren't eligible to take part. Yeah. Uh, there's always the risk that the, the patient subgroup, like with most published studies, is obviously very highly selected. Um, and it probably reflects the patients with the most severe PA and might not reflect the wider undiagnosed uh, population of PA. There's also uh, the risk that it's actually quite a small cohort that they've used, it's only 87 patients. Um, the other thing to note is that the, the ethnicities for the patients in their cohorts are actually very varied, uh, which is obviously reflective of their local population, but it differs very much from the cohorts that were originally used to define these scoring systems, which then makes you wonder whether the results from this study actually only apply to the Barts area and their population, and you can't really extrapolate it to other parts of the country or maybe other countries where that ethnicity is going to be very different. It was just one thing that the point of adrenalectomy cardiovascular risk, it was not to treat the hypertension. And I guess these scoring systems focus yeah. on blood pressure, but obviously we well. you can bestow some benefit from just treating the electrolyte abnormalities as well. Um, can you give us a, a, a bit of more of a clue as to all the fight, the PASO scoring system for those of us who haven't used it? Do we have a sort of, on one of your earlier slides? Yeah, just quite what we're, what we're in and, and, and what the cutoffs are. So you've got um, five variables. So you've got the, sorry, six. You've got the duration of hypertension, uh, the gender of the patient, their BMI, the defined daily dose of the antihypertensive that they're on. So on the previous slide that I showed, it basically lists all the antihypertensives. You put in the dose and then it works out what that defined daily dose is for you. And then whether they've got evidence of target organ damage and also the, the nodule size imaging. And the scoring for the drugs is a yes. higher Should, number if you're on lots of drugs? No, show us the drugs. So BMI, uh, if you're very obese, you get zero. If you're thin, you get some more points. Yeah. So, so if you're overweight, you're less likely to benefit from surgery. Yeah. yeah. If you're a man. And if you're on lots of drugs, you get a zero, basically. That's right. Okay. So can, is it what we, can we, okay. Do we need this scoring system? Well, that's what you can tell us. I think he might say, he might nodule. say no. Nodule. Nodule size of imaging. Mm -hmm. Large, Large is worse. Is, Yes, there's a big tumour, you take it out, you cure them. So it's like cure cold. Yeah, that's yeah. right. A big tumour is a condad nova. Right. A large number. Oh, it's going to benefit from surgery. Yeah. Yes, it goes up. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. But I think we do a lot of this subliminally that in the MDT, like don't we? We sit in the MDT looking at it, we always quite big. Yeah, let's offer it. Yes? We, we have to do this without thinking about it. So if you've already got renal impairment or left ventricular mm -hmm. hypertrophy, so in summary, in this study, what they've done is they've undertaken a fairly comprehensive comparative assessment of those six available preoperative scoring systems. They show that in their data sets, there was no single best performing system, although the PASO and the Utsumi outperformed two of the other systems, so the Morisaki and the Wachel, but didn't show um, significance over the remaining two. They justify that these systems also carry the advantage over the other four because they give you that individualized likelihood of cure for the patients. So possibly could be more promising for widespread use. They show that in their cohorts, the performance was better at late rather than early follow-up, which may suggest that these systems have a role in long-term prediction follow-up. But what the study doesn't really tell us is how best and if and at what time points you would ever use these scoring systems if you're going to incorporate them into routine care for patients with PA. Yeah, I, I, wonder, I wonder what they actually do at BARTS now, whether they actually use it prospectively. Yeah. Because I think we do without realising it. We, we look at the patent MDT, there's an argument about the suppression test, and then someone says, no, that was really low, so it'll definitely be beneficial. And that's basically in the scoring system, but hidden. Was, was age in the scoring system? Age was age? Yeah. Yes. So age was in um, basically one 
lucky and they sue me. Yes, but it's not in all of them. Not not the duration of hypertension. Yeah. I think we do. We, we do, don't we? We look at the patient and then fast because I look at the BMI and then, <laughs> yeah, we do. And it biases our decision making to some extent, but not in this nice objective fashion. I guess the nice thing about this is that it actually gives you a sort of a, a stat that you could potentially discuss with the patient themselves. So for the complete or whether they're likely to not have the organ hypertension of their hypertension. Yes. And do you think a year is long enough? Because it might come back at three years. Do you hear that question? Do you think a year is long enough? So, so the, the mean, I think, for the follow-up in their group was 50... 53 months for their late follow-up. So the early follow-up was within the first year, but then the late follow-up was any time after a year that they did their data analysis for. I mean, there are certainly some where we think it's sort of bilateral and we decide to operate knowing it's going to come back after some years. And we kind of make a kind of decision that there'll be enough benefit in the young person to justify it. Yeah. It's Florence. Sorry, I'm just walking to the clinic. Um, thanks, um, Ed. That, that's a very good presentation. Um, I mean, I, I'm very surprised by the relatively low cure rate. So they said that their relatively low cure rate uh, at early follow-up is that they felt like, the, because the mean follow-up was only four months, they think if they waited close to a year, that their follow-up, their cure rates may have been higher. That's what they say. And actually they say that the, the cure rates are fairly similar to other international series. So they didn't particularly feel that yeah. abnormally low. Yeah, so, so one, one of the problems is that the um, definition of unilateral PA, and I mm. know that at parts they use different criteria. And so even for the AVS, they don't, do not use the contralateral suppression index we use. So it's much less stringent. So that, that would be a, a big difference to our data set, I suppose. And, and also there were quite a lot of patients who, who didn't have AVS. They may have a methomidate scan, but they, that's not specified in that study. But even the AVS criteria are different from the ones we used. Yes, so first of all, they use they, they use um, synactin stimulation and they don't use the same contralateral suppression index we use. So, so our cure rate may actually be better for those where we mm. truly say it's unilateral. Yes, I was just going to say, I also agreed with Florian. <laughs> I was quite taken aback by the poor cure rates, if that's the right word, um, it, it, as, the, sort of as the study follow-up extended. And then I was trying to work out, because they talk about clinical cure, don't they, as well as biochemical cure. And then I was trying to think, is that just because if you observe someone over time, as one ages, your risk of hypertension increases full stop? And is that why over time you don't get a good clinical cure because everyone's risk of hypertension goes up? I couldn't quite work out if that's what they meant. Because I also was a bit taken aback by that bit. 